So, let me tell you a tale. A tale of trains. Long ago, there was a little boy named Walt Disney. Walt loved trains. I mean Walt Disney really, really loved trains. The farm on which Walt grew up was next to a railroad track. He loved to sit outside by the track and watch for trains, and a beloved uncle of his was even an engineer. At age 16, Walt left home and for a time he traveled the railroad lines, and when he was older and would eventually move to Los Angeles to find his calling making movies, it was a train which carried him there. Biographers like to imply that Walt loved trains because of what they represented to him. Things like freedom and possibility and progress. I never thought it was that deep. I mean, Walt Disney is a man whose taste in food never evolved beyond grilled cheese sandwiches and chili, which, I mean, relatable. I imagine that Walt loved trains in the way that little boys love Lightning McQueen. Trains are big and they look awesome and they go fast. And if you have a little toy train, you get to go choo. But maybe that's not it either. One of the boyhood tales of Walt Disney was that he would lie on his side in the dirt next to the railroad tracks and he would press his ear to the rail and listen, sometimes for hours, until he would hear the rumble of a distant train. What else do you think he heard? What whispers do you think the locomotives shared with him on those still afternoons? Is it possible that they told him of his destiny? Did they rumble instructions? And what did they promise in return? You might be wondering why we're talking about trains. So this video is about Star Wars land, but I have to talk about trains because trains are in its blood. Trains are its blood, like the veins are railroad tracks and the blood is trains. Without trains, we'd likely have no Star Wars land because we'd have no Disneyland to put it in. When grown-up Walt Disney was running his animation studio, he bonded with one of his top animators, Ward Kimball, over their shared love of trains. The story goes that Ward had Walt over for dinner and then just super casually and organically mentioned that he happened to have an elaborate miniature railroad in the backyard. I like to imagine that it was actually Ward playing an elaborate game of 4D chess after he found out that the boss loved trains. In 19 1948, Ward Kimball took Walt away to a weekend at a railroad fair. It was basically a bunch of hobbyists showcasing their tiny railroads. Each of the hobbyists wanted their train to stand out from everybody else's trains, so basically they would each pick their own little theme of what environment the train would be set in. So Walt spent what he would later describe as the best weekend of his life, watching a bunch of tiny trains rolling through intensely themed environments. And I firmly believe that this experience planted the seed which would later grow into the idea of Disneyland Park. Park. Walt came home and built his own extensive model train set in the backyard. This one was one-eighth scale, which, hey, that's pretty big. He named the train the Lily Bell after his wife Lillian because Lillian was less than pleased about the train. I don't know if this helped. When Walt drew up his plans for a theme park, which was initially a much more modest idea called Mickey Mouse Park, it was a very simple concept, just a little village, a couple rides, and a train around the outside. Eventually, this idea expanded into the Disneyland Park we know today, and by the time it reached that point, it had expanded to be big enough to get its own full-size railroad. To this day, you can visit Disneyland and ride a full-size steam train, one of which is called the Ward Kimball. Or, if you're a member of the Secret Club 33, you can ride in the luxury caboose called the Lily Bell. But you can't stop progress. Just like you can't stop your husband from building a train in the backyard. <laughs> Sorry, okay. What am I thinking? This is going to be a really long YouTube video about Star Wars Land, Galaxy's Edge, the new very large section at Disneyland Park. Nobody is going to watch it if I don't break it down into some kind of numbered list. Since it's Star Wars, I decided to call the bullet points episodes. Star Wars Land Episode 1. Why Star Wars Land? In the early 2000s, the Walt Disney Company was looking to expand by purchasing the theme park rights to the wildly popular Harry Potter series. So it's going pretty well. Rolling is in talks with Disney. Everyone just assumes they're going to get it, but suddenly they start butting heads over rolling wanting more creative control. As legend has it, the point of contention was a train. Where's my train? JK wanted a full-size Hogwarts Express to carry guests into Harry Potter Land, and Disney said that was too much. Both Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom at Disney World had full-size trains already and couldn't comfortably house more trains. Adding a Hogwarts Express to the existing parks would be expensive, unnecessary, and logistically inconvenient. The Walt Disney Company's new CEO was no Walt Disney. Too many trains, he said. 
I assume. We'll have no more trains here. You monster, Jenny said. We will have trains here, as long as a dream is alive in a child's heart. Oh, sorry. I was reading from my fan fiction again. Whoops. Anyway, the CEO was anti-train and he would suffer for it. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter would open at a competing theme park, Universal Studios Orlando, and see huge success, thanks in part to its large new train. Its success was even enough to pose a threat to the powerful Disney parks. Disney's first attempt at competition, Pandora the World of Avatar, was beautifully designed and saw massive attendance from guests, but it wouldn't be considered as much of a draw as Wizarding World was for Universal, nor did it inspire anywhere near the level of interest in merchandise. Their second attempt to compete with Harry Potter would be their own Star Wars land. It would coincide with the release of a new trilogy rebooting the franchise, and it was going to be big. 14 acres, which is the largest expansion Disneyland Park has ever seen since it opened in 1955. If you're not a frequent visitor to Disneyland, but you are peripherally aware that it's situated inside the very busy city of Anaheim, you're probably wondering where all this extra space came from. And that brings us to Star Wars Land Episode 2. The Land. Despite being the third teensiest Disney park worldwide at only 83 acres, Disneyland Park is one of the most popular in terms of sheer annual ticket sales. And that's because the cream rises to the top. The limited space means that if an attraction is too unpopular or just deemed too old, they will take it out and replace it with something new. Sometimes they even take out an attraction that everybody likes for no reason. So whenever Disneyland gets a new ride, chances are that it is sitting on the bones of a the ride that came before it. The land on which Star Wars Land is built has actually been home to two different attractions. The first... Mm, well, that's right. I guess it was a train. All of aboard the mine train will leave and ride away. Heading for the wilderness where the barren coyotes play. Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland was inspired by the old Disney nature documentaries and was a slow, sprawling, easygoing ride through the western wilderness past over 200 animatronic figures of bears, elk, beavers, mountain lions, rattlesnakes, wild pigs. Segments of the ride included the western town of Rainbow Ridge, bear country, Beaver Valley, the Rainbow Caverns, and the Living Desert, a whimsical portion with mechanical rock formations that would tumble menacingly toward you, and human-looking cactuses. Desert heat sometimes gets to you and makes these here cactus take on strange shapes. In addition to the mine train, you could also go through nature's wonderland on a stagecoach, a Conestoga wagon, or a pack mule. All of these other ones were pretty short-lived, but there were like two magical years where all of these different modes of transport were going through the wilderness simultaneously. Not to go on like a giant tangent, but to me this really exemplifies Walt Disney's commitment to using modes of transportation as not only conveyances, but as sort of a futuristic mode of ornamentation. So if you're going through nature's wonderland on your little train, you might look overhead and see a rock bridge with a pack of mules going across it, or see a full-sized covered wagon lumbering by in the distance. Over the trees you can see the very top of the paddle wheeler making its way down the river. These aren't just rides for the people who are on them, they are also symbiotically enhancing the experience for everybody in their sight line. It made for a very lively section of the park and also just made you feel like you were in a real western wilderness being explored by settlers. Early Tomorrowland, my personal favorite, operated by the same principle, so you might look out and see from one vantage point a people mover train, a skyway bucket, a monorail, and a submarine all passing by in the same view. Anyway, the mine train was the longest surviving conveyance through nature's wonderland and it had a pretty good run. It lasted clear up until 1977, the same year Star Wars hit theaters. That's a coincidence. It's just kind of cool. But some nature's wonderland remnants and references survived for years and it's still kind of a darling of old theme park enthusiasts. The ride's loading area and a large chunk of its land was taken over by the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad roller coaster, which is kind of a spiritual successor even though it's much more exciting. It reuses the buildings of the town of Rainbow Ridge and a handful of the mechanical animals. Tortoises! A buzzard! Show me the snakes! Show me the snakes! 
first lift hill of the roller coaster takes you through a cave, which is a visual reference to the Rainbow Caverns. And you know, it's a train. Down the trail from Big Thunder, they even put in a little tribute to the Conestoga wagons. This was during Disneyland's partnership with McDonald's in the late 90s and early 2000s. They constructed a building that looked like a covered wagon and it sold McDonald's french fries and nothing else. It was known as Westward Ho Fries, or in some cases, the Conestoga Fry Wagon. I don't think any of us will ever see anything as kitschy in our entire lives as the Conestoga Fry Wagon, and I miss it dearly. I was really hoping they'd bring it back for Star Wars Land. Maybe like park it right next to the blue milk so you'd have your hot fries and your cold blue milk. There are dreams that cannot be. A few more of the mechanical animals from Nature's Wonderland still populate the rivers of America, which you can see from the Mark Twain Riverboat. The remains of the Bear Country section can still be seen on a trail leading between Thunder Mountain and Fantasyland. The tunnel that used to let out onto the old trestle bridge is now looming over a big empty lake. A chunk of the trestle and the track itself was left hanging out of the tunnel initially, and it stayed that way for years until eventually rough weather caused it to tumble down into the lake. I'm genuinely curious as to whether it's still down there. This is a bit spooky, right? The bears are long gone, but when the water level is low enough, you can still look down in the lake and see the jumping mechanical fish that they used to try to catch. I think it's cool that Disney still leaves this effect switched on as kind of a throwback. But we want to turn our attention to that living desert section I was talking about. The living desert scene with all its cute little cacti and its tumbling rocks would comprise most of the land that would eventually become Star Wars land. And there is a unique quality to it, which I would like to discuss. You see, since it was a desert, they couldn't have any sight lines to any of the things around it, and there was a lot of stuff around it. There were trees all around it, there was a huge lush river on one side, and then on the other side is fantasy land, so if you saw any of that, you wouldn't feel like you were in a desert. So, to create a visual barrier, the entire desert section was dug out to sit roughly six to eight feet lower than everything surrounding it. Initially, after the closure of Nature's Wonderland, the living desert area became a barbecue restaurant restaurant and a petting farm, but to build these attractions, they needed to get the land level to the walkways around it so that guests could go into it without traveling over a hill or falling into a pit. So you'll remember when I said that the Nature's Wonderland ride had over 200 animated figures and that only a handful of them, like maybe a dozen tops, would go to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and the Rivers of America. So what about those other critters? Well, the critters of Nature's Wonderland had deteriorated from age and from years of sitting outside, some of them in water, and with no immediate plans to move them anywhere, they would have taken up a lot of storage space. So, legend has it that in kind of a two birds, one stone solution, they decided to just throw all of the unwanted critters into a giant pit in the living desert, pour a bunch of concrete over the whole thing, and never speak of it again. So guests would unknowingly be walking over the mass, unmarked grave of countless mechanical bears. On that note, let's talk about the next attraction to occupy this land, Big Thunder Ranch. The barbecue was all you could eat, and it had live music, and it was pretty popular. At the petting farm, you could meet goats, donkeys, cows, turkeys, the giant horses that work on Main Street, and Jenny. Hi, Jenny. How are you Hi. doing? I'm doing good. Yes, I worked at the petting farm. I loved the petting farm. Um, the petting farm was not popular. It was a favorite of the young, the elderly, and guests with sensory issues who just wanted a quiet place to chill for a minute. But Disney takes hourly counts of their attractions, and it's not like a petting zoo can compete with Space Mountain. According to my manager at the time, the petting farm had the lowest hourly counts of everything at Disneyland. I'll never forget how, when I talked to him about the impending closure of the petting farm, he told me, it wasn't a matter of where are we going to put Star Wars land, it was a matter of how are we going to replace the petting farm. The petting farm was on some pretty prime real estate because it was at the outskirts of the park, and behind it was just a large empty festival center, a big grassy hill, a barn, and a parade storage building. It was a good space for outward expansion, it just needed a little juggling. The biggest accommodation is they did have to completely reroute the Disneyland Railroad, but in doing so they actually added a lot of scenery and embellishments to the train's river crossing, including a lot of references 
to mine train through nature's wonderland. We've got waterfalls and beavers and a giant beautiful railroad trestle. I was hyped. Star Wars Land itself even took a page out of the Living Desert's playbook. They wanted clean sight lines and they also wanted to build tall structures to have good force perspective and some big alien rock spires without visually disrupting the rest of the park. So they actually carved a large concave area back into the earth and put everything lower than its surroundings. I wonder if they dug deep enough to strike pay dirt and accidentally unearth a lot of animatronic bear and elk skeletons. That would be a fun day on the construction site. Best of all, this land is rich with big train energy. Star Wars land was not only once occupied by a train, it is also hemmed in by trains on nearly every side. Casey Jr. Circus Train is its closest neighbor to the east, Big Thunder Mountain is to the south, and the Disneyland Railroad is to the west. So Star Wars land is chugging into the station, and now it just needs its story. Star Wars Land Episode 3 the lore. As with Pandora, the world of Avatar, Star Wars Land is intended to be a fully immersive experience. But unlike Avatar, Star Wars has a large established fan base who care deeply about the canon. So the Imagineers had to make it fit in with everything that came before it, and this was accomplished through a multi-step process. One, invent a new Star Wars planet. This gave Imagineers the freedom to make the landscape whatever they wanted to, but also to feature whatever creatures or characters from Star Wars they wanted without disrupting the established canon. So they can have big orangey rock work that matches Big Thunder Mountain on the Frontierland side, but also have a back way that transitions into forest and rock work to merge it with Critter Country in the back. They can have Bantha milk and porgs and ancient Jedi artifacts. Consequently, Star Wars Land has four different names. Star Wars Land, which is what it is. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, which is what it's officially called. Batu, which is the planet that it's set on. And Black Spire Outpost, which is the location on Batu that you are specifically in. Step two, fire the director of one of your Star Wars movies and replace them with a director who's willing to add an extended sequence that is solely there to establish the existence of trains in the Star Wars universe. This would appease the train spirits and prevent misfortune from befalling your theme park. Step three, start referencing Star Wars land in all of your canon material prior to its opening. On Star Tours, I'm basic, I'm basic, don't make fun of me. On Star Tours, they added an ending to the possible carousel of endings that took guests to Batu. Too. Oh, Baku, hell yeah. Although each of the story segments on Star Tours are randomized, I believe for a good long time this was the only one you could get. Yes, I believe this adventure is just beginning. Batu was also featured in the novel Thrawn Alliances. It made a little cameo in the Star Wars Resistance cartoon, and it got its own Marvel comic series. The story of Batu is that it is a once great Outer Rim world, which is now used as a stopover for travelers and smugglers on their way out into wild space. It's currently occupied by the First Order, but the Resistance has also set up a base in the very same outpost. That last part is kind of funny because of the proximity of the two organizations. So you have Kylo Ren's big ship and periodically he will stomp out of it and he's like, where's the resistance? And Rey is straight up doing photo op meet and greets like a block away. But that's Kylo's problem. He's too focused on his work. If he just walked around the corner to get himself a hot dog wrap, he'd see the Millennium Falcon. It's parked in the middle of the street. But speaking of Rey, her theme park story is even funnier. Sometimes she'll hold still in one place, usually out by the building that's going to be the Rise of the Resistance ride, which is the Resistance base, and also sometimes by the Millennium Falcon photo op area. But they avoid setting up a queue and having people meet Rey one after the other. Instead, she is on Resistance business. The best thing Rey does is if kids come up to her, she will tell them that she's on a mission and she's hiding from stormtroopers, and then she'll take them around on an adventure with her. Then they'll basically just go around the land and hide in doorways and behind garbage cans. In the olden days, this was how all Disneyland characters functioned. They didn't have a sign set up telling you where to meet them and they didn't form a line. They would just show up and be around and kids would gravitate toward them. They would just wander the park like they live there, which is what you're supposed to feel like. And sometimes they would even climb onto rides with you. Then the concept of the character meet and greet was recontextualized into an attraction of the park, a rite of passage for little girls wearing matching princess dresses, and a marketing opportunity for your Disney PhotoPass photographers. There are a couple characters who are still free range, like 
like Peter Pan will just wander all over Fantasyland, and Alice and the Mad Hatter still go play musical chairs with kids at the ice cream parlor. But the princesses are so in demand that they built them a dedicated royal hall for photo ops. You line up, and then they march you through, and you meet three in a row like it's an assembly line, and the character hosts have an hourly quota they're supposed to meet. I understand the need for this. They wouldn't have started doing it if the demand wasn't there. But that never made sense for Rey, and before Star Wars Land opened, they did have a dedicated Rey meet and greet, and she had a little backdrop that they made for her. It was a little room with like a map and a console with buttons, and it's like Rey isn't a political leader like Leia, and she's not bubbly and outgoing like Rapunzel and Snow White, so like why is she in this room? holding court with strangers and none of the performers could do the accent and you just make awkward small talk. <laughs> That's one statement I am not going to include a clip to support because I don't want to just cruelly single out one ray. But this new thing is such a fun idea and it's going to make such a better lasting memory for the kids that meet her. I also like the way it kind of reshapes the character's function into an active playmate for kids. It almost discourages adults from approaching her and like you still can and it, she'll even come up to you if there aren't any kids around, but I think the idea of having her play a little pretend game with you is a good way to establish that boundary because it should be for the kids at the end of the day. And mostly I like to imagine that episode 9 is going to come out and just have a 30 minute action sequence of Ray wandering a market at a light jog crouching behind one trash can after another in a seemingly aimless pattern. Also, Rey sure is quick to trust and recruit every single person she runs into on Batu. Are you sure this is the best way to keep a low profile, Rey? As far as the physical sense of immersion goes, it's fantastic. Disney, as always, has their sight lines down to a science. Like, you can't see anything else while you're inside, and you can't see inside when you're in the other lands, so it doesn't ruin those. I really wish companies like Universal or Knott's Berry Farm cared about this so you wouldn't get things like a Homer Simpson head from Hogwarts or a roller coaster track in a western ghost town and all the employees are extremely into it. If you go just know that basically everybody at the park wanted to work at Star Wars Land. They even made a video surprising people by telling them they got accepted to work there like they were winning the lottery or something. So definitely don't overlook the cast members as a resource. Like if you see anything that you're curious about or just have any questions definitely approach them and ask. They are just as excited about Star Wars Land as you are. A lot of them have made up their own backstories and characters. Like there was a guy selling me water bottles whose thing was he likes to eat porgs. A lot of them are doing fun space hairdos. And when they go to costuming, instead of having a set costume like everywhere else in Disneyland, they are given a large selection of pieces they're allowed to mix and match. And that's to help them establish their character also. First guy I've seen with this hat. It's a bold choice, but I respect it. If you're talking to an employee and they look like they have a minute, definitely ask them questions about their characters or the surroundings or props. Ask them how they feel about the First Order. If you see a blaster mark, ask them how it got there because odds are they've either made up their own story or it was covered in training and they're excited to show they can remember it. One of my favorite moments was I was in line for the lightsaber experience and we were in this courtyard and there was a tree with colorful scraps of fabric tied to it. At one point, an employee arrived and started tying more scraps of fabric onto it and this was opening day so I was like, oh, it's a designer punching it up or maybe guests disrupted some of them and he's fixing it. But I'm near an employee, so I just point to this man and I go, what does it mean? Yeah. Oh, that man is tying fabric onto that tree. Yeah. He's what, does what does it mean? What does it mean? And it turns out it does have an explanation. This, this is a wishing tree. What, oh. right what do you have to do to make it come awesome. true? Right um, it just kind of lives on the tree and as the tree grows and blossoms, oh. your wishes will come true. I wonder what he's wishing for. That's the kind of thing that makes the experience really special. As in Avatar Land, nobody is supposed to acknowledge that they're in a theme park or that Star Wars is a movie series. In Avatar Land, the Avatar movie is the documentary, and in Star Wars Land, the Star Wars movies are the legends. This land also, of course, has its own lingo. Bright suns and rising moons are their greetings, depending on the time of day. Somebody was telling me that the planet Batu has three three suns and I think two moons and I believe this employee was telling me that they're all out at once and I don't know enough about space to know if that makes sense. But anyway, that's why they're all about their suns and their moons because they just have a bunch of them. 
So it's always on your mind. Wheelchairs and strollers are transports, and my personal favorite, I don't know, is supposed to be only the ancients know, which I have yet to see employed, but I'm very excited for the eventuality. I remember that for people that like clickbait articles, before it opened, everyone was like, well, if you go to Star Wars land, you better know to call the bathroom the refresher or they won't tell you where it is. It's like, no, customer service still comes first, obviously. It's just clickbait. Uh, they call it that, but they obviously still answer you. It's obviously just like if you ask where the bathroom is, they say the refresher is that way and you understand through context clues. It's not complicated, guys. Definitely use the lingo while you're there because it is fun. I don't make the fun rules, it just is fun. I imagine that working at Star Wars Land, uh, when the crowds pick up, is going to end up being a very stressful experience with a lot of unhappy guests. I worry that as guest satisfaction issues arise, they will start discouraging their employees from being so in character. Or the employees will stop having so much fun and not be so into it, or they will simply run through their first crop of employees and not train the subsequent crop of them quite as intensively. If I may hit you with a fun fact, which I love, I was once in a break room and a veteran employee of California Adventure swore to me that when the park first opened, all of the employees of the boardwalk area were asked to affect an old-timey carnival barker accent, like the CEO was just really enamored by the idea of this and asked it of them in training. But nobody was doing it and the employees were bad at even being asked because it is kind of a big ask. Management was tired of trying to enforce it because they weren't into it either and it was very quickly just written out. They're like, no, we're not gonna do that. I've Googled around about this extensively and tried to find old home movies of the year the park opened and I've not been able to verify this as fact at all, but I want to believe. Nobody in Star Wars Land is being asked to do carnival barker accents, but I think it is a reality of theme parks that as things begin to age, that level of attention to detail and effort begins to wane as the realities of training and maintenance set in. So that's why it felt very important to me to go to Star Wars Land soon after it opened and catch all those strange and interesting things which might be changed or abandoned later. But how are we getting inside? Star Wars Land solo a Star Wars Land store. How are we getting inside? So we all knew I was going to go to Star Wars Land and do an appallingly long video on it, but that is easier said than done. In anticipation of large crowds, access to Star Wars Land is very restricted for the first month and a half of its life and will continue to be somewhat restricted after that. During that first month and a half, there are only three ways into Star Wars Land. Let's work through them together, shall we? Option one, press previews. Traditional media always gets previews of Disney events, but so do bloggers. They get to go and get footage of everything Thing and not deal with horrible crowds. This was obviously my first choice, and I thought I stood a pretty good chance. I wouldn't rank myself in the upper echelons of YouTubers, but theme park YouTubers, that's a much smaller pond. They have relatively lower numbers, so I'm not a big fish in the ocean, but I am a sizable koi in this pond. A couple of theme park YouTubers were nice enough to pass along the email contact for Disney's social media coordinator, so I decided to reach out ghosted. No response whatsoever. That's embarrassing. Let's never talk about that again. I'm a small, small little fish. Stop kicking me while I'm down. Option two is getting an online reservation. Option two is simple and free. However, these reservations completely booked out in less than two hours, and a lot of people were stuck in long online queues and might not have made it through in time. Between me and my friends, we managed to secure two free online reservations, but they were not until a couple weeks after Star Wars Land opened, and I was afraid of things selling out, so, option number three, a hotel stay. I affectionately call this one the obscenely expensive option. I said that the free online reservations booked out immediately, but there is a loophole. If you book a stay in one of Disneyland Resort's on-property hotels, you are guaranteed entry to Star Wars Land on that visit. This could get me an opening weekend, which is mega exciting. I was only able to get a reservation for the day after opening day, but my friends at Podcast The Ride got one for opening day and they offered me a spot. So that's that, right? Wrong. Option four, cast member preview. This one's a wild card. Employees of Disneyland sometimes get previews of upcoming attractions, sometimes but not always, and they never get to bring guests. I used to work at Disneyland, but that was a while ago, so I was not even considering this. But then they decided that cast members do get to bring friends. And even though my friends like to punk me by pretending they're going to bring somebody else, one of my friends did bring me as a plus one. So not only am I going, I'm going on May 26th before it even opens. Now, if for some reason you are watching this video actively and not just passively waiting for me to tell you things, you might have noticed that I I've secured myself not one, but five entries into Star Wars Land during the reservation period. This is crazy and excessive, right? 
Most people don't even have one. So you're probably wondering why I need that many and also why I didn't at least cancel the expensive hotel. So let's talk about the catch. Each of those methods, all of those reservations I just mentioned, those are not all day entry into Star Wars land. Those are each only a four hour time slot. Furthermore, I can't count the cast preview as a day for gathering footage because it's before the media day. So there are no photos or video allowed. I don't like to do anything halfway. And I was really psyching myself up about the Star Wars land opening. I was having nightmares about it. So I was thinking about all the things I wanted to do in Star Wars land. Ride the ride, buy the merchandise, build a lightsaber, build a droid, go to the cantina, eat at the restaurant, take photos. Then you step back and think, Realistically, any one of those activities I just named could represent like a two hour wait in a line. And that's not even allotting time to just wander around and soak in the ambiance and like observe things. So I decided to go five times, I'm sorry. 20 hours in Star Wars land. You're probably wondering what this costs. Let's break it down. To get a non-park hopper adult ticket for one day in Disneyland Park in peak season, which it is now, it's $149. To park, it's $25. To get a room at one of the on-property hotels and secure that included guaranteed Star Wars land reservation, you have options. The cheapest room you could possibly book would be at the Paradise Pier Hotel and cost $503 per night plus tax. And it's not a very good hotel. Those obviously booked out first for the weeks around Star Wars land's opening, so I just went with the cheapest option available to me. My room at the Disneyland Hotel after tax totaled $761.67. So I would just like to thank my Patreon friends because oh my god. And yes, you still have to pay $25 to park when you have a room at the hotel. I am a small fish being kicked while I'm down. So that brings our grand total for one guaranteed visit to Star Wars Land up to $935.67. That's expensive. Rogue One, a Star Wars Land story. Project Stardust. Project Stardust was a multi-year Imagineering initiative to prepare Disneyland for the arrival of Star Wars Land, and the idea of it actually philosophically shaped Star Wars Land itself, too. In my opinion, Project Stardust is a very exciting and mysterious name for something that's ultimately actually pretty boring, but I still want to talk about it so bear with me because I have strong feelings. So Project Stardust was born of the idea that once Star Wars Land opened, Disneyland was going to be met with the biggest crowds it had ever seen. And as such, subtle changes needed to be made to physically prepare the park for these crowds by maximizing walkway space and keeping people moving through them. To accomplish this, they relocated stroller parking areas, redesigned some structures whose support beams impeded walkways, and removed planters and benches. That all sounds good, except for that last part. Did you notice that part where I said benches and planters? Because they weren't being moved, they were being removed. Management is replacing all of that lost seating, but only inside of restaurants. I think the average guest is not likely to really notice the effects of Project Stardust, but hear me out. After they closed my petting farm at Disneyland, I relocated to work at Guest Relations, so a large portion of my job was fielding the complaints of angry guests. In my experience, the number one stress for theme park guests is that they run themselves ragged all day without even noticing it. To the point where, by the time they come to complain at City Hall, a lot of them don't even want anything. They're just very upset, and you just kind of have to nod sympathetically, like, that's most of the job. They spend all day freaking out, thinking about how they spent a lot of money to get there, like, for example, $935.67, much more than that if they're from out of town, and much, much more than that if they have a big family and a bunch of kids. And so they just panic about doing as much as they can and getting their money's worth. If your whole family is exhausted and you pass by a little shady planter, maybe a bench by a duck pond, it might occur to you that, hey, you should sit down for a second and not be moving around and stressing out. Maybe you get a turkey leg or watch the horsies pulling the streetcar or pull out your park map and gather your thoughts. Maybe have a chat about what you've all liked about your day so far and decompress. If you don't pass by any convenient benches on your way somewhere, you feel really guilty asking everybody to go way out of their way so you can try to find a place to sit down. Psychologically, it doesn't feel like an easy little break anymore. It seems like you're grinding everything to a halt and wasting time and wasting money. So you keep pushing and you keep moving and you don't even realize you feel like you're dying inside until it's 5.30 p.m. and you're standing in the middle of pizza port having a family meltdown because your son Brayden only eats chicken tenders and you don't want to go all the way back to Frontierland. He's crying 
crying, you're crying, your spouse is crying, and suddenly your marriage is falling apart. Maybe somebody caught cat flu. It's not a good time. And besides, Disneyland is all about atmosphere. It's made to be observed. There are hidden details everywhere. Buildings pump out smells and ambient audio tracks, and you're not going to notice any of that if you spend all day hustling from one place to the other. So anyway, I really feel Project Stardust in Star Wars Land. There are huge, massive walkways. It feels like a lot of expansive space, but there's practically nowhere to sit. I remember walking outside the droid shop, and there's this little fenced-off decorative area with little droids to look at. I kept looking at the droids and then looking around me, and I didn't really know why until I realized that I was looking for a place to linger, and I wasn't finding it. I wasn't even really looking for a bench. I was just looking for, like, a faux alleyway with maybe some steps leading to nowhere, and then people would sit on it and congregate. It would be shaded, and then you could just sit there for a minute and look at the droids. I assume this expectation came from Diagon Alley at Harry Potter World or Main Street at Disneyland, which both have exactly that. But nope, not here. To add insult to injury, Star Wars Land does have little faux staircases that don't lead anywhere, but they're all so high up that guests can't get to them, or they're behind a little gate. Like, they're only to be observed. Please do not sit on our fake staircase for some reason. There are, by my recollection, no formal benches in Star Wars Land, although there are some low planters. There are some space shipping crates that enterprising guests can try to sit themselves on. These are all crowded with people at any given time and most of them are in direct sun. Also, if you have any kind of physical or mobility issues and you can't sit very low or jump up onto something, you're going to have even more limited options. Everything about it just subliminally telling you not to linger. In keeping with Project Stardust, almost the only seating in Star Wars Land is inside of the two restaurants. And uh, that is also limited. I'm going to talk about that later. All of this together makes Star Wars Land extremely exhausting. After my first four-hour time slot, I felt like I'd been there for three days. Another casualty of Project Stardust was the free-roaming droids. When the land was announced, all the concept art had free-roaming droids rolling around through the crowds and interacting with people, and then as they kept releasing more concept art, you started noticing that it didn't have free-roaming droids in it anymore. This little guy named Jake even appeared for test drives around Tomorrowland in 2017. Hey, thank you, droids. By the way, I might just be paranoid, but I'm fascinated by this guy with the sideways water bottle. You can see him following the droid around like that in every shot, and he never pulls out a phone to take a picture. And this video has a white sweatshirt water bottle guy anyway, I just thought it was interesting. Anyway, Project Stardust is reportedly the reason for scrapping these droids and not putting them in Star Wars land at all, because they would cause people to gather and take photos and would impede foot traffic. The real reason is probably budget cuts, obviously. Building and troubleshooting and maintaining these droids is expensive, but more than that, Disney. Disneyland's only puppet show, Disney Junior Live, ended a 14-year run in 2017 because of Disney's tensions with the puppeteering union. Yeah, I guess negotiations weren't going the way they wanted, and Disneyland decided that puppeteers were just too expensive to bother employing. Also, remember the last time we saw Jake was around that time. But anyway, Project Stardust was the excuse, so I still blame Project Stardust. I mainly just mention the droids here because I want people to know that we could have had free-roaming droids, and if nobody knows that we could have had them, nobody's gonna be upset that we don't have them, and if nobody's upset that we don't have them, we will never have them. If a lot of people want droids, maybe someday we'll get droids. So, you know, tweet, tweet them or something. Tweet at Disney that you want droids. Actually, if we've learned anything from the history of Star Wars Land, it's that if we really want free roaming droids, we have to get Universal to do it first, and then Disneyland will get embarrassed, and then they'll do it. And like, come on, foot traffic is not a valid excuse for not having droids. Because like, impeding traffic flow because people want to stop and take a picture? Doesn't that sound like the castle? Is that next, you guys? Gonna take out the castle? Yeah, an efficient walkway is great, but you can't live your life in efficient walkways. Imagine existing in a place where every square foot of land is an efficient walkway. You can't stop moving or you're in somebody's way. You're constantly being jostled. And if you try to step to the side and lean against a wall, an employee in a vest urges you to keep moving. That place actually exists. It's called San Diego Comic Con, and it's a nightmare. Never go there. I appreciate the efforts of Project Stardust and the simple initiatives like the stroller parking and 
and widening the walkways. But I think when you focus on efficiency over comfort and atmosphere, you're obviously going to have a negative impact on customer satisfaction in the long run. I moved. So I mentioned guest satisfaction and you're probably wondering how this is going over with the customer base. Well, the story of Star Wars Land is still developing. We are still in the prequel portion of the Star Wars Land saga, but I'm sure some of you have noticed that there are already loads of clickbait articles about how Star Wars Land is failing and attendance is low. This is attributable to a lot of different factors. A big one was Disney being overcautious and blocking almost all of the local annual passes and warning people away in anticipation of huge crowds that just never materialized. They overprepared for these huge crowds to the point of basically begging people not to come and like it kind of worked. So what did they expect? I do personally think it's still very early, things are still developing, and I think the next year after this period is going to be very important in actually gauging the success of Star Wars Land. But I also think thus far a big culprit in the ghost townness of Star Wars Land is Project Stardust. Disneyland has been pretty uncrowded for a summer season this year, but Star Wars Land has been especially uncrowded and it's brand new. And like, can we even pretend to be surprised when it's a land designed to bring people in and then efficiently cycle them back out? It was literally designed to be impossible to hang out in. Project Stardust is doing exactly what it was designed to do, but I think it's to the detriment of the land. The only silver lining here is that Project Stardust is not like a hard thing to undo. It's not hard to add benches. It's not a big strain on the budget either, which apparently is a deal breaker for a lot of things. Unless the benches decide to unionize, then it's all over. So, whew, I think that's, that's all anyone wants to hear about Star Wars Land. Mission accomplished. The philosophy behind shaping its walkways and um, animatronic graveyards. But wait, I promised you a tale of trains. I would have expected to circle back around to trains, like in much in the way that a train would circle around a track. Well, this tale is not over. You've just witnessed the prequel trilogy, plus two other things that you didn't ask for. But there's actually a lot more to cover in excruciating detail. The food, the merch, the activities, the ride, the second much more impressive ride if it ever actually opens. This feels like I'm setting up a call to action, but I'm not. I just, these just are things that I'm going to talk about whether you want me to or not. All of it just, like Star Wars, became much too gargantuan for a single trilogy or video to contain. So I hope you'll all join me on this journey in the next video. All aboard! Choo! Choo! This part was the boringest one, which is why it's also my favorite. So each subsequent one will be less exciting for me, but more exciting for all of you. So that's, you know, good. Also shout out to my friends for ruining the audio of all my footage. Thank God I just talk over the clips anyway. If you're on the right Jenny side, you're, from fans. you're all the way to the right <laughs> side. And he's still from her fans. She's still from her fans. <laughs> Oh! <laughs>